Um, I want to support the, the rainforest project because I do very little along those lines. I, do, I tend not to join things. I, do, I tend not to join movements. But I found over the years it's been troubling me. I, I feel kind of guilty. I whinge a lot and complain about these things, but don't actually do anything. And it was Bob Geldof. I was speaking about Bob Geldof one evening. I was asked to do a programme about him and his efforts to do stuff. And, and on thinking about him, it was, that's the conclusion I came to. He actually did something. I think about it and worry about it every bit as much as guys like him. But he actually got off his bum and did something. And I think a lot of us think a lot about it and worry about it and think that's enough. When I think of the industrial rape of the forests worldwide, it makes me kind of depressed. And that's why I'm trying to get involved, because being depressed isn't really enough. It only Depression just affects the people around you and makes them depressed. I'm a carrier of depression. <laughs> I had the great privilege uh, last year of uh, making a film in the Arctic. And we sailed the Northwest Passage, and uh, and it was lovely to do. But in the middle of it all, I think we shouldn't be doing this. The Northwest Passage should be frozen and should remain frozen. And we sailed through it. You would never know there had been snow there, and we better get a grip pretty quickly, because the snow is disappearing. The the climate's changing. The whole miners who have been desperate to get their hands on all those minerals up there, are heading for there because the gold is gone and, and the next phase of destruction is about to happen. So we better get a grip because it'll unleash all sorts of fury if we don't. The great thing we can do, and we're a pretty useless bunch, you know, storytellers and joke spinners, what we can do is attract the media and point at things. This is our, our most powerful function is to point at something, whether it's unfairness or, or something is out of balance or something is in a worrying state. And, it's, and it is an enormous uh, task. It's a great benefit to be able to get the camera and the microphone and go, look. We can look after the place. That's, that is the very, very least you can do, is look after the place and try and leave it better than you found it. At least leave it the same as you found it. But to leave the planet worse than you found it is a crime. As a matter of fact, if you believe in this kind of thing, it's a sin. Orangutan, I think, is possibly my favourite animal on earth. I, I went to a bookshop in London, oh, it must be about five years ago, and the guy bullied me into buying a book which I gave to my grandson, and it's a book of primates, eh, or apes, and uh, the, it's a big coffee table book, but on every sort of third page, uh, there's a full page of one or, or other of the ape species looking straight into the camera, so therefore looking straight into your eyes. And it is extraordinary how close we are. I, if you saw this book, I guarantee some of them will remind you of people you know. And I've, I've done it to various people say, look, just flick through it. And they go, Mike, I know him. You know, <laughs> they just stare right into it. We are so close. So, so close. And we can't, we can't abandon these things. We can't um, uh, just abandon all those spaces and say, shame. Shame isn't good enough. I love frogs. And I love frog spawn. And I have all my life. When I was a wee boy, we used to go up to the Botanic Garden. I lived in a tenement in a town called Partick. And we used to go up every spring and get frog spawn at the Botanic Gardens in this little pond. And we'd avoid the gardeners and run in and get some in a jam jar and take it home. And put it on the windsill, the windowsill of the house and watch it develop the tadpoles and the wee legs appear. And then you'd put little bits of mince in and they would eat it and grow and become frogs. Well, I was up getting my frog spawn one day and there was a frog there. Must have been about... It would sit on the palm of my hand there, but it was a, a decent, a big brown frog. It was a beauty. And I grabbed it and I put it in my pocket and took it home. And then I lost it. And I said, I've lost my frog to my friends. It must have jumped out of my pocket. <laughs> and we're walking along and Frankie McBride, my friend, said, I can see your frog. 
and it was halfway up my back. It had, to this day, we didn't find a hole in my pocket, but the, the frog had gone through a hole into the lining in my jacket and was, was wandering around and inside the line and climbing around me. And eventually we had to rip open the line and get them out. <laughs> oh, that would be the name, Puddock, P-U-D-D-O-C-K. That's the Scots dialect for frog. <laughs>